municipal meeting. Let the record reflect that all council members are present with the exception of Chair Chaburka who is joining us online uh, through the Zoom. And we will begin uh, our meeting with a Pledge of Allegiance and I've asked uh, Council Member White to lead us in that. Please rise if you are able. And repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We will now observe a, a moment of silence. Thank you. Um, next, we have on the agenda acknowledgments. Any from the council? Any acknowledgments? Okay. Very good. Well, the first thing we have then, moving on to our request to be on the agenda, the Ogden Regional Medical Center Presentation Lifesaver Awards. And we'll have uh, Jeff, it's French, Camo, Camo? Oh, yeah, pretty good. Como. Uh, Como. All right, Jeff Como. I put the accent in the wrong wrong spot there, but thank you for coming up to. Absolutely. He goes by a lot of other things too. Yeah. <laughs> Como, Como's a good one. So thank you for giving us this opportunity and time to, to kind of recognize some of the great achievements that's happened just recently. Just a background on this was last year um, in 2022, we set a goal to change the survivability profile for sudden cardiac arrests. We did some traveling across the country to try and find out what best practice was and brought it back to Ogden City. It has since moved to Weaver County and Morgan County, and our hope is to spread it across the state of Utah. So as of late, we've had two um, cardiac arrests that people have survived. One is a middle-aged man that, that it spent Christmas with his family, walked out of the hospital because of early CPR and because of the sharp work done by these men and women that are here today and their rapid response. Another one was a young man, a 13-year-old boy who should be here um, any second, who was playing basketball and fell over to cardiac arrest and walked out of the hospital two weeks later, survived, um, and is back with his family. And so <clears throat> that being said, I'll sit down and I'll let uh, Jeff, he's the uh, relations director for EMS for Oregon Regional, old fire chief Roy, um, has been a great partner for us. So I'll turn the time over to him and get out of his hair. Thanks, Chief Slater. Great, thank you everybody. Uh, Ogden City Mayor, Council, Fire Department staff and community members. I'm Jeff Colm, I'm the Northern Utah EMS Relations Director for HCA Healthcare, the Mountain Division. Uh, our mission statement um, for HCA Healthcare is above all else, we're committed to the care and improvement of human life. I'm honored to be here today representing HCA Healthcare, Mountain Division and Ogden Regional Medical Center and presenting some life save awards for two recent 911 calls in our community. The quick action, professionalism, and skill of these responders change the outcome of someone's life forever. At Ogner Regional Medical Center, we truly value our first responders for what they do every day for the communities they serve. We work hard together as an EMS hospital team in building great relationships, training together, and improving our processes to provide the best care possible for our patients in our community. On behalf of Ogner Regional Medical Center, I just want to thank them for their dedicated and committed service and for being there when we need them most. So with that being said, I just want to kind of mirror what uh, Chief Slater mentioned. We had a couple incidents in the last few months that kind of, kind of show our efforts of working together and doing great things in our community. So we just like to recognize a few of Ogden City's uh, firefighters. The, the, the first call was a middle-aged man in his 40s, collapsed at home. Uh, CPR was started uh, originally by his family, uh, Medic 5 got on scene. This was a multi-jurisdictional response. We had Ogden, South Ogden, and Weaver Fire District responded on this call. Uh, Medic 5 responded, um, kind of did their thing, started uh, life-saving interventions on the scene, transported him to Ogden Regional Medical Center. When the patient got there, we continued those efforts. Uh, he, had, he went to our cath lab, our heart center, had some interventions done, 
ended up um, being in our hospital for a few days, and ended up walking out of the hospital uh, with no def deficits and a full recovery and was home for Christmas. So this just kind of goes to show the great work, the responding, how the quickness and everything we've been doing to try to in improve some cardiac arrest survival in our county. So we'd like to recognize them. Uh, this, the first couple of awards are for Raymond Smith and Derek Gags. Gags, sorry, excuse me. I don't see the family yet, Slater, so I'm not. Have you? Oh, there's a dad. The okay, all right. Perfect. About how far out are they? Are they pretty close? Um, pretty close. My wife just called me. I think she's trying to figure out how to get oh, in. Oh, how to get in? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I'll kind of take some time here while we're just kind of waiting for them to show up. We appreciate you coming. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, absolutely. You're, you're absolutely fine. So this is a unique circumstance for us because we have the family here with us tonight on this, on, on this next case, which is interesting because um, we do a lot of things. 13-year-old um, cardiac arrests aren't super common, but they, they do happen. Um, this next case involves um, them. And hopefully they'll, they'll walk in here real quick. We'll go ahead and kind of talk about this case a little bit. Um, this was a multi-jurisdictional response as well uh, between Weaver and Ogden City responded on this call. This is a 13-year-old boy that was playing basketball. And the interesting thing with this, uh, he collapsed and went into cardiac arrest playing basketball. Um, bystander CPR was started by one by an off-duty firefighter and another medical professional, an MA uh, lady that was on scene, started CPR. Um, Police arrived. Our dispatchers played a huge role in this call as well. We actually recognized them and the police officer that responded to this call last week with, some, with the same awards. Um, interventions was started on scene. This kid was uh, defibrillated, transported to Ogden Regional. He was stabilized, then he was flown by Air Life. There's Christian. He was flown by Air Life down the primary children's for uh, continued care, and then uh, was discharged um, home with his family. So his family is here today. This is them. We just <laughs> you know, you're good. Sorry to throw you on the spot as soon as you walk through the door. It's okay. Uh, this is dad, mom, and it's Christian. Um, so thanks for coming again. We really appreciate you guys coming out. So um, anyway, I, don't, I know you just walked in the door, but do you guys want to say anything really quick? I just kind of talked about the case a little bit and what's going on, but I'll let you guys say a few words if you'd like to. <laughs> do you want to say it or I will? Want to say something? Okay, I will. Um, we if just you want to um, just come up, come up so yeah, that way people online can hear you. Thank we, you. We just want to, uh, through this experience, just recognize um, uh, how much that the hours and years of training and and um, the skill of these people matter. I mean, it mattered for us on that day and matters for us every day subsequently. And um, we have a deep respect and gratitude for that, for the resources that are put into um, to helping these individuals learn what they know and, um, and just for their, their professionalism. It was a, a, an incredibly scary experience and we know it doesn't all, always turn out the way it has for us. And um, we know that uh, that uh, they they played a, a major role in that, and we're very grateful. We know that God played a role in it as well, but we just are will be grateful every single day. So thank you very much. Thank you. So the crew members that were uh, on this call is Maggie and Tyson. I'll have you guys come up. I got a couple words. So much. 
she brought you some lifesavers. <laughs> <laughs> Just like I mentioned before, it's, it's just an honor to be here. I'm so proud of the work our EMS responders do. My background comes from the fire service, and I'm very passionate about, you know, about service, the care we provide, patient care, all of our processes. So it's nice to work together as a team to just keep increasing our relationships, making them better, which raises the bar, which increases our patient outcomes and is, uh, creates better care for all of our patients. So again, Big thank you to Ogden City Fire Department for what they do. Thanks for serving the community and being committed to the service you guys provide. And on behalf of HCA Healthcare and Ogden Regional Medical Center, thanks for letting me come out today. Thank so you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Can you. we have? Thank you. Can we have those who received awards and and your teams and and Chris and your parents come up for just a picture and that'd be awesome. Come on up. Come on up. Thank you. Vice Chair, you might want to invite the Chiefs and the Vice Chiefs. Oh, yes, as well. please. Chiefs later. And Vice Chiefs. Yes. Assistant Vice Chiefs. Chiefs. All the Chiefs. All, all, the, all the big cheeses coming up here. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I a window right here. Cover me up. Because yeah, cover me up. That's the plan. Yeah, right? There you go. Yep, perfect. Is that right now? Um, Chief Slater, I was going to ask real quick. I know that you talked about response times being extremely important, and maybe just a, I don't know, did, did these come arise through the Pulse Point app? That is this separate, but also important? So these are separate. Okay. Um, but they did come from what we call our Lucas training. So we, we went on, on a, like I said, a mission to improve the, the profile for cardiac arrest. So we started with the dispatch center to improve the time somebody calls 911 to the time they're on chest, and they did a fantastic job through our Weaver 911 center. The next step was how can we be more efficient as first responders? So our, our medical team here in Ogden City developed what we call the Lucas Trainer. The, the Lucas device is already out there, let me make that clear, but how we decrease the pauses in CPR was developed here. So we can go from hands on the chest to mechanical CPR in less than 10 to 15 seconds. And the two of the medics, Raymond and Derek, uh, were part of that team that helped it take that countywide. Well, Weaver County, Morgan County. The third phase was the bystander CPR, which is the Pulse Point app. We're close to a thousand followers now that follow us on the Pulse Point app. Chief Matthew and myself are headed, and Dr. Grow are headed to Cache County to try and help Cache County implement Pulse Point. And we're headed down to, we've had some reach, some reach out from St. George, Santa Clara, Ivans, who want to figure out how we got the app um, funded and got it going. And uh, Jeff Como, who I don't think <coughs> left, was instrumental in helping us get that started within this county. Ogden Regional was a great partner in that, so awesome. hopefully that answers your question. Absolutely, yep. So Thank everyone, you. download Pulse Point. Download Pulse Point. Yeah. Yeah, please. Follow Weaver 901. Can, Thank you. can I make a, a quick comment? Yeah. So um, I, a couple of months ago, uh, I experienced um, uh, having to have the uh, response of our uh, Ogden Fire Department and paramedics come out um, and uh, although the outcome of my sister-in-law ultimately was not um, what I have wanted it was um, of your skill and getting her to the hospital that allowed me to be able to even talk to her um, she suffered an aortic aneurysm and, and as you all know that they don't very often make it to the hospital and so Thank you for your skill. Thank you for all that you guys did to get her there so that I could go and thank her and love her and tell her that I loved her. And so thank you 
all for what you do, and um, I just really appreciate it. And I know her family does as well, so thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Any other comments from the council? Okay. Next up, we have the Ogden Weber Community Action Partnership Circles Program. And here to present, I'm sorry I didn't get your, your name, but you, if you would introduce yourself. And, of course. Yeah. Uh, hello. Um, I am Cody Ann. I'm here from Ogden Weber Community Action Partnership. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Uh, ALCAP's mission is to elevate individuals, families, and communities of Weber County by improving self-sufficiency through services and collaboration. We have many programs at ALCAP that help us achieve this mission, but the one I'm here to talk to you about tonight is CIRCLES. Uh, CIRCLES is a long-term initiative that helps to break the cycle of intergenerational poverty. To achieve this, participants began by engaging in 12 weeks of training, covering topics like creating a budget, increasing financial capacity, and understanding the hidden rules of the middle class. Upon completing the training, our participants become circle leaders. We call them leaders because they are the ones who will lead themselves out of poverty. But they can't do this alone. So we match each circle leader with one or two circle allies. These allies are volunteers from the community that work with circle leaders to set goals and help build intentional social supports. These social connections are a crucial part of the circle's model. We acknowledge that who you know can be as important as what you know. Um, I'm so sorry. Oh, you're fine. Okay. So, we acknowledge that who you know can be as important as what you know. While many families uh, from middle or high income backgrounds have access to these networks of support, families in poverty rarely develop such contacts. And many families living in poverty are hardworking and motivated, so when we create a circle of support around them, advice is given, contacts are shared, and the fears that keep people living in poverty begin to disappear. So our circle's allies have the incredible opportunity to make a difference in the community that they live in and to witness the impact that they have firsthand. So Circles is already making a great impact in our community. Last year, nine families that participated in our program were moved to financial stability. But community involvement is still an important part, and so we're actively recruiting Circles allies for our program. So if you or anyone you know would be willing to offer your time, your knowledge, or your support to help a family in Weber County, please get in touch with us. You could make a huge impact for a family working to exit poverty. And I promise you that the, the benefits for our volunteers can be just as great as the benefits to our participants. Author J.F. Holmes said that the best exercise for the heart is reaching down and lifting people up. And our Circle's allies have the opportunity to do exactly that. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any comments or question for Cody Ann, right? I have a comment. I think. Uh, I, was, I was invited to speak to uh, the participants in your program uh, uh, about a year ago or so. And, uh, um, and I've known about this program for a while. Uh, I think a former council member, Jesse Garcia, used to run the program. That's right. Uh, Circles. Yes, and he used so, to work with us. Right. <laughs> So I just want to say thank you uh, for everything you guys do. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank, thank you, you very much. It looks like you might have some um, brochures. You're welcome to, to leave those with Brandon, and he can get those to us, and that oh, will help to try and spread the word and, and get involvement there. Thank you. Okay. Up next on our agenda, we have the common consent items for the fiscal year 2023-24 financial principles, and uh, Christmas Village Committee uh, reappointments. 
uh, or yeah, consideration of reappointments. Make a motion to approve the common consent items. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Lopez and a second by Councilmember Heyer to approve the common consent items. This is a roll call vote. Just okay. It's roll call. There, there's a resolution. Oh, oh, there is a resolution. So we will need an, um, uh, um, a motion to adopt a resolution. No, we just need a roll no. call vote. I, yep. I don't know what I'm doing up here. Just so. need a roll call. Just we need just a roll, need roll call, call vote. vote. I thought that's what I said. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, she just didn't know. Yeah. He's a new guy. Councilmember Blair? Aye. Actually. Councilmember Heyer? Aye. Councilmember Lopez? Aye. Councilmember Nadolsky? Aye. Councilmember White? Aye. Vice Chair Ritchie? Aye. Chair Chaburka? Aye. Okay, that passes. Thank you. Um, on to new business, we'll invite Glenn Symes up to uh, discuss the communications plan for proposed noticing amendments. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, this will just take a, a few minutes um, as part of a, a compromise a number of years ago uh, in how the council could uh, extend the consideration for an item. Uh, part of your rules and norms state that uh, if that's done, if that extension happens, the next week we would come back with a communications plan to let everybody know uh, what the what the plan was moving forward. So uh, with that, uh, uh, I've had some preliminary conversations uh, about what our next steps could be. Um, we feel like the uh, noticing costs and the readership information, those are some things that council members were interested in. Um, that could come back fairly quickly. Um, but we did want to have, uh, we did want to do some additional research on the noticing. Um, so we are proposing to take a few months to do sort of a, an audit uh, of our noticing process. Um, this would include uh, tracking uh, which notices are in fact going to the paper, um, what the cost is for those notices, uh, where else the notices are being posted, because they don't just go to the newspaper, they go to other places, um, and how quickly and how consistently those notices are showing up on the state's website. That was something that came up as well. Um, so Barton had mentioned that uh, with the Planning Commission he'd like to uh, have a sign-in sheet for a while. Uh, to help understand where people are getting their information. So to sign in, where did you find out about the meeting or where did you get your information uh, to see how, uh, how many folks uh, are in fact getting that from the newspaper. Um, and this also gives us a little bit of time to go through some of the recent changes uh, with this most recent legislative session. Uh, there was a bill that was passed that had some changes to uh, noticing requirements for cities, so that gives us a little bit of time to go through that and make sure we're in compliance with everything there. Uh, so we would anticipate coming back in a, in a few months uh, after we go through that process. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, as part of the compromise uh, with the extension, uh, because it was not tabled to a date certain, um, this item will be noticed again uh, when it's ready to go. So if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer those. All right. Any questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, we are now at the uh, public public comment section of our meeting. Uh, please, when you come to the podium, uh, state your name and limit your comments to three minutes and um, address any, any topics or items. Hey, bye. Um, Heath Sato, Ogden resident. Um, first, I wanna thank all of you for listening. Um, I know it's not always easy to hear what we citizens have to say, and some of it may come across as accusatory or even toxic at times. Um, we cannot know everything that happens in closed sessions, so we'll never know everything that goes into your choices. So at times, this perceived toxicity comes from a place of frustration, since as citizens, we can only directly affect choices that our government makes every so many years. Uh, between elections, all we can do is ask of you and hope or heard. Uh, so again, I, I, I thank you for listening. Um, I just wanted to quickly address a couple items that were originally on the agenda, agenda for this evening. Um, as you know, there's a single company that's currently slated to develop at least four major properties that Ogden City has pledged to them. These projects could total upwards of half billion dollars worth of development or more, all running concurrently in our community. This includes the development of Union Station, the touchstone of our community's history. 
Additionally, tonight there were to be updates to the developer selection process due to ongoing concerns about the transparency of that process. Just yesterday, these items were removed from the agenda, likely due to your sincere concerns about the process used to place so much of our city's future into a single basket. While I appreciate the care taken making these decisions, I believe it's prudent to take a step back and reassess the situation. I understand that many of these projects are brought to you late in the process and you have little time to review these major decisions. That's why I urge you to take this opportunity to contact outside experts on these issues, such as Urban 3, people at the county level, and commercial retailers who have no financial interest in these projects. By doing so, you could gain new insights and possibly identify potential problems that may have been overlooked. As our elected representatives, you have a covenant with the citizens of Ogden to prioritize our well-being. I believe that fulfilling this promise requires a willingness to change course when new evidence comes to light it's a sign of strength, not weakness, to reassess our decisions and make adjustments when necessary. I'm not asking you to take my word on any of this. Um, I, I'm just asking you to take a metaphorical breath, uh, evaluate your choices, and seek out as much outside expert opinion as you can gather. By doing so, you can make the best possible decisions for our community and ensure that we continue to thrive and grow as the heart of Weber County. So again, thanks for listening and thank you for your commitment to making some of the hardest choices for our community of almost 90,000 people. Thanks. Thank you. I noticed on the next meeting there wasn't necessarily public input for two of the items, so I'd just like to address those. Um, one of the unique things you is, sorry. sorry, Travis Pate. Yeah. One of the dynamics that I found is from 1973 uh, when it says city council creates a new department and then it calls for a hearing. And the new department was a basically community development, which was to oversee the RDA responsibilities. And uh, some of the responsibilities, it simply said that they would use all forms of media to, to present Ogden City's predicament <laughs> and try to get more people involved by way of citizen participation. And so, I, so that goes back to the, the newspaper noticing. And I think that that would be just pretty shameful to just, because we can, we do it. Uh, many people argued, like even Henry David Thoreau talked about the fugitive slave law. And he said, just because it's right in law doesn't mean it should be done. They act as if they can morally slide down the hill a little bit a ways and then somehow magically end up back at the top. And so that was in his journals of June 17th of 1853. And so if we're, if, um, there's, I found dedication aspects of the Union Station when it was first dedicated as a museum and just the, the aspects of saying, what are we going to do? We're now buying that property. Are we just going to turn it over and say, oh, notify us within 30 days if you've sold the property and entered a contract? It, it's pretty, that's pretty, like, let's put the fox in charge of the hen house. We've had problems with communication and how property is, disp the disposition of properties. No, take ownership. When they were potentially rezoning uh, 24th Street, 550 24th Street, None of you were at the planning commission meeting, yet you're all board members allowing saying, yeah, let's look at this rezone. And let's look at this developer who's coming in and asking for a non-conforming use permit to rezone property that we own. And we're like, oh, let's just go ahead and throw some of these zoning guidelines out the window, but then go ask for a non-conforming use so we can just shoehorn this development into this property site. And so I think that the one key thing is an RFP should be followed by an RFQ. I mean, an RFQ should be followed by an RFP. Request for qualification should be followed up by a request for proposals. We're shoehorning 28 townhomes when we, in our neighborhood, were told that that would be match the neighborhood. And it's now rezoned to an R13, again, to shoehorn, and yet no master plan as far as here's the art district, here's the Central Bench National Historic District. What can you do to make this the most amazing place? No, nope, we're going to use the pattern of geography of nowhere. Something that can be built anywhere, shoehorned into the downtown. 
And so I think that that's the part to me that I have the biggest problem with is just like I said, I would hope that on the next meeting you do ask for public input. I know it's not required, but I'd please ask that you do those things. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Travis. <laughs> He's over there watching the World Baseball Classic. Those kind of noises are very common. <laughs> no. Good evening, Teresa Bramwell. Um, I wanted to give you, uh, tell you a little bit about what happened in the planning commission meeting I recently attended to get permission to build, rebuild my home on 25th and Monroe. Um, and I was very disturbed by some of the events that happened to long-term property owners that came into the Planning Commission to simply use their property, to simply put a tenant in their commercial building, or simply put themselves as their own tenant in their commercial building. And they were being classified as developers these are people that own one property that are current taxpayers of the city of Ogden that are simply trying to use their own property. And they're being classified as developers and required to meet an entire host of development requirements. One guy had to tear up his whole parking lot, put in half of his parking lot as grass, and then put in a watering system underneath his parking lot to come out and water the new grass that he's being required to build to tear out his parking lot in order for him to basically clean cars to sell them at a wholesale auction. This is his own property. I just cannot believe the, the hoops that individual private property owners that are taxpayers of the city of Ogden are being required to do and being classified as developers. I think that that is playing fast and loose with the English language. I don't think somebody that's a property owner and a taxpayer of the city of Ogden of one property is necessarily a developer. And it, it broke my heart to see that these people were being forced into this pigeonhole to spend vast amounts of money simply to use their own property. And we're allowing developers to come in and take property that's owned by the city of Ogden, and we're giving them millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to basically throw all the laws, all the zoning laws out the window. Developers are getting rights that individual property owners will never have, and that's not right. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments in the, come on up. And for those that are, those, those that are online, if you would like to make a comment, you just raise, go ahead and come on up. Um, Mine's a question. Somebody can yeah. answer it, I guess, when. Um, my name's Laura Lewis, and there's a little, I don't know, you guys probably get the same water bill I do, and there's a, a little uh, block in here about Wonder Block, and there was, it was quite confusing to understand what this was all about. There's a quote in here, right, at, well, there's a parenthesis, like it's a quote, but there's the rest of the, the parentheses are missing. And it says, as a mixed-use pro project woven into the heart of downtown Ogden, Wonder Block represents an important addition to our city's capacity to support the defense ecosystem. What is the echo defense ecosystem? I've looked all over the internet, and the only place I find that is in relationship to defense contractors where they help subsidize uh, their uh, manufacturing and development. There's also another quote in here that, or a statement that um, the, uh, this development is bringing a lot of high paying jobs. And um, from what I know of the development and what it lists here, 
retail office space, grocery, boutique hotel, blah, blah, blah. Those are traditionally service jobs and low paying jobs. So can someone tell me what is coming into that development that is bringing the high paying jobs? And um, that's all. Thank you. Good evening. Mike Anthony, hi. So uh, we all know that tomorrow the feds are gonna meet and decide what to do about the interest rates. And your taxable values of real estate, particularly you all spoke about residential, is based one year on arrears of sales that happened the year prior to the assessor's take. So be aware that things are gonna drastically change. In my 40 plus years of experience, when real estate values uh, are affected by interest rates, there's usually a negative impact as they start to climb exponentially away from a certain market. You had interest rates at two, three, four percent, and you just heard numbers that were unrealistic. They were the same core numbers that gave us 2008. So be aware that the amount of money you have available today from taxable incomes on residential property is going to drastically change because Mr. Powell at the chairman's office said he needs to raise interest rates. And it seems that everything above five and a half percent quarter point rise in the Fed run fund rate will have a 5% negative impact to your residential values. Already, this is what's causing many banks at the local level to be in default of their lent monies out versus the asset that backs it. They're upside down. Right now, many banks have loans that are more money went out than the house will appraise for today. And I used to go around the country looking at this all the time, and it's starting to look to me like it's going to happen again. And I don't know what the feds are going to do, but tomorrow's a very important day for the beginning of some of impact that's going to have on real estate residential values. So when you're thinking about what you're going to spend money on, remember that it's going to take a whole extra year before the income stream is affected by the valuations. And so this year's taxable valuations are based on stuff that happened over a year ago from appraisal points of view. And so the sudden impact to the taxpayers is going to happen in real time. And it's something to measure when you're looking at what you're doing down the road. That's just some sage advice. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Getting more decrepit. <laughs> Hi, I'm Teresa Holmes, a uh, Ogden resident, and I just wanted to put in a little thing here. You know, um, it was Teddy Griffin who led the charge to save Union Station from uh, destruction in the 70s by putting in the museums and updating everything. According to museum history, Griffin's involvement started when, as a member of Junior League of Ogden, she was able to get the station on the National Historic Registry in 69, which became the key to uh, Ogden obtaining the station from the railroad. You know, and I mean, she had a marvelous personality. I knew her, and a marvelous laugh. And uh, Bob Geyer and a member of the Union Station Board said Griffin had a unique ability to get things done and get money from private en entities. Well, anyway, I was awarded the Teddy Griffin Award. And the thing is, is that she stepped in and saved the, mu saved the station by putting the museums in there. The museums saved the station. So why should the museums have to go, you know? I mean, that's my thing. I love those museums. I love every part of them. And I think if Teddy Griffin was here, she would be aghast at what's going on with the museums. I'm glad they put everything back. And the only reason they did is because you guys took a visit down there. They have never done a yearly cleaning. And you know, the new gal that's running at McBride, she's actually doing a great job. You know, and I'm just saying, the museums saved the station. We need to save the museums. And that's all I have to say, other than um, 
I have won a few awards as a volunteer. And Damon didn't get to take away my 7,000 volunteer hours. I quit before I did. <laughs> have a good one. Thank you. Good evening, Angel Castillo, Ogden resident. Um, I wanted to lift up a couple of things that were brought up during the work session, uh, specifically something that I haven't been hearing anything about that I think we should, and that has to do with flood preparedness. Um, and, I, and I'm pretty proud of Governor Cox for putting money in the budget to do floods when flood containment when we were in the midst of a drought. I know that uh, my hometown Ogden stated that they were ready and willing to go and that's great. They're an amazing organization. But what are we messaging uh, as an, an entity to people? Like right now, if you asked everybody in your neighbors, what would you do if the street flooded? Who do you call? What do you do? Where do you go? I think we should probably be looking into that because I'm pretty confident we're gonna have some real challenges with, with water considering our snowpack is up to, and gratefully so, uh, levels in the 80s. Um, I'd also like to uh, lift up something else that I heard in the session with regards to the presentation of extending the CRA for the airport. I've sent you all an email that uh, has a 66-page report from the Office of the Legislative Auditor. Um, and it's uh, report number 2022-10, it's 66 pages. And basically, they're looking at how uh, cities and municipalities are using TIF. And we are listed as uh, providing no evidence that the project areas or the plan objections, objectives were tracked, provided no evidence that developer objectives were tracked. This is best practices. And I'm not saying that anything is wrong, but until our house is in order and we actually are verifying that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, that is as recommended by the state, that we pause everything. I, I'm asking you to review current and proposed TIF projects to review efficacy compliance with the auditor's best practices suggestions and pause any extensions of uh, new creation of CRAs, um, such as the airport, until we're in compliance just to make sure that we're buttoned up and we're doing things the way that we're supposed to be doing them. Um, I think that that's something that needs to be addressed to make sure that we're doing best practices as recommended by this great state. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the audience here? Or online, I'm not seeing any hands online either. We have one online, no? Okay. Um, comments from administration. Thank you. Um, the ecosystem question you have, Mr. Cooper sitting behind you right after this meeting, if you'll ask him, he'll explain to you all about that. And um, as far as the flood, um, we, we have had snowfall like this before. We haven't always flooded. We do know the pinch points in the city. We spent uh, about an hour this morning with our uh, senior management team going through um, those pinch points. We have 20,000 sandbags. We have sand. We are prepared. We have a communication plan to start communicating to citizens. There's a few cities in our area that maybe jumped the gun a little, and now they don't have any sandbags, and they don't have any sand. and. Um, uh, you can't sandbag your way around groundwater that comes up in a basement. And I think that that's kind of what was happening in some of our sister cities. Um, but the rivers, we know, we know where we flood on the rivers, on both rivers. We know um, where we need to protect. We know where um, it gets uh, limbs and things get clogged and back up the river and, and causes problems. We're working on all of those. We're working with the county. Um, we have um, we have substantial amount of work that we are ready to do. I was asked by the standard examiner yesterday, uh, why aren't we panicking? And I said, it all depends on how fast it gets uh, hot. If it doesn't get hot very fast but gradual, it'll come down just fine, and we probably won't see the flooding 
um, that we could have if it turns off all next week, 90 degrees, we'll see, um, we'll see, we'll see problems. But we've got those conditions uh, put together as a city. We're ready for it. Um, and we will, and we've started communicating last week uh, through social media. We'll be communicating even more as time gets closer to um, seeing if there is uh, a need for it. But I assure you, we have spent a, a lot of time on this and we are ready uh, to uh, handle this. And we have Jay Ladder, who's been doing floods for 40 years, and he knows, um, he knows that as good as anyone. We have Vince, we have others that work for us that are very competent. We have Chief uh, uh, Matthew, who's been chief since 1995 and has experienced uh, many of these occasions. And so um, I, I consider Ogden City well ready for the experience if it happens. I don't have anything else. From the council, any comments or go ahead. Yeah. Just, I was just wondering if we could have Brandon answer the question about the ecosystem for everyone to hear. Would that be all right? <clears throat> uh, sure. It's no secret that um, Ogden is. Uh, long been the home of a, a manufacturing base. That manufacturing base has led into aerospace and defense with the, with the uh, adjacent Cedar Hill Air Force Base. So an ecosystem is essentially a community of like-minded, in this case, businesses that are working together to achieve the same goal. And so this isn't necessarily our words. This is, these are words that um, the uh, DOD, and Hill Air Force Base and the military espouse as well. And so our role as um, a leader in the, in the creation of the e ecosystem, largely based on our initiatives and as well as our geographic location and our, and our manufacturing base, we're trying to lead out in ways that we can bring uh, businesses together to support the mission of the military and the Department of Defense. We have a downtown, we have physical assets that those companies, both public and private, like. And so we're um, learning from them as to what they want, what they need, and what they um, will uh, utilize in terms of um, fulfilling their missions. And so Wonder Block, in the, in the sense of that example, um, is a response to that. 100,000 square feet of office is something that we anticipate will be filled um, with aerospace and defense contractors um, bringing jobs that will uh, be on the higher um, side of the of the pay range. And those are things that we're not making up. That's part of this uh, role that we have in this ecosystem development and the, uh, what we're hearing from our military partners. Does that help? Thank you. Thanks. Any other comments or from the council? I would like him to, uh, before you sit down, Brandon, sorry. Let's do a lap. Just jump over. Get his steps in. Yeah, you got your, yeah, good. Tracking your steps. Hey, will you just address the, the audit that the state has put out? Yeah, um, so we uh, were, took part in that, of course. So we had two auditors come to our office for a number of weeks. And we shared with them um, essentially all of the books of the RDA in each of the project areas. They chose to hone in on, on uh, one, which is the Hinkley um, Airport. And so although we disagree with the finding, um, because we can point to the results of our um, tax increment spending, it's a building sitting out there adjacent to the runway. Um, that was the essence of the project area creation. Uh, we disagree with their findings, but there are certain things that we have um, learned from the audit that we've talked to the auditors about that we can do to make sure that our paperwork is in order. So there's nothing alarming there. There's nothing that would cause uh, the need to stop the presses in terms of RDA development. It was, um, it was just something specific they were looking for. Instead of being able to point to a physical asset as the outcome, they wanted documentation to represent that as well. Yep. Okay. All right. Any more? Anyone? 
I don't have anything for you, so. All right. <laughs> um, all right. I just wanted to make a quick comment about the, um, the thank you for everyone who came and shared um, uh, your thoughts, and, and hopefully some questions are answered there. Um, that the, I just want to talk just briefly about the My Hometown Initiative. I, I did take part in that, and I just think that's a great opportunity. I've always thought that you really don't have to look very far to find somebody who needs some help. And that's really what that program's about, is just helping neighbors identify those that need help and figuring out ways to, to, to work together. And, you know, when you do work together in that way, it's a way to break down barriers. And, you know, they said, what did they say, knit hearts together or something like that. So um, I think that's a, it's a great opportunity. And I'm excited that it, that program is continuing. And for those that have an opportunity, the dates were laid out there, that, you know, there are opportunities to, to come down and do some service. And I think you'll be excited about helping out and also the tacos, which were pretty good. So, <laughs> all right. If Act, nothing else. Acting chair, oh. do you care if I say something real quick? Please, yeah. Sorry, I know you're trying to set a record for first time ever getting out here at seven, but um, um, I, I, I wish we would, I would have said this earlier with the, with the fire department here. Um, as council members, we get to go to the fire banquet and the police banquet, and it's wonderful to be able to, to, to see the, the, the amazing things that they do throughout the city. And, and one of the other amazing things about that is they're, they're not the ones that tell you how amazing the, the amazing things they're doing. And I, I just really appreciate both of our chiefs for instilling that within our residents. Um, we, we talk a lot about, you know, getting to watch heroes here in our community and, and, and our first responders truly are heroes. And they, um, they're not heroes because they drive around the city looking for a way to, you know, do something heroic. They, they simply drive around and when they're called upon, they step up and they, and they do what's, what's, what's asked of them or even more. And, and then they go back and continue to do their work and, and do their job. And, and so I appreciate the, the mentality that our chiefs have here within our city and, and, and the, the great first responders that we have here in our city. And I, I appreciate their willingness to, to just get in, get, get the experience, get the knowledge, get the preparation, and then, and then be, be ready when they are called upon to perform. And then it, it, it starts, um, well, it, it resonates throughout the entire city. So I thank everybody here. It's, it's wonderful to be part of this team. And I, it's, it's inspiring to be able to see the, the great acts that, that, that many of the people here that work for the city do. And, and I'm glad that we had someone outside of the city to be able to come and tell us and share those experiences because because I, I don't think I don't think we would have ever heard about them so it's it's it was great so I just wanted to say that I I truly admire what they do and and not only that but how they do it so thank you well said um, before we entertain a motion I got, oh go ahead I got a little comment I I, I kind of think it's <clears throat> I wasn't going to say anything but I. I, uh, in response to uh, the comments about planning commission, um, I wasn't. All, I also wasn't at that meeting, but I have been to hundreds of planning commission meetings. And uh, I, as as a planning commissioner, I, I sat and we and we reviewed city code and uh, community plans and, and and those kind of things to weigh. Uh, you know proposals that were that, that were presented to us, and uh, planning commissioners don't make distinguishes dis, distinguishment between people as being developers or non-developers, but they do weigh everything against city ordinance. And and while it did it did break our hearts a few times to have to say yeah you have to comply with city ordinance to to do what you want to do. And yeah, it's probably going to cost you some money. Um, we expect that of everyone, and we we try to treat every, everyone the same that way. I mean, ordinance applies. They're they're using uh, their authority uh, for land use. Um, if there's a situation where some of these developers that are doing bigger projects are getting away without doing following city ordinance, I'd be interested. But I don't, you know, we, we try really hard to make sure that doesn't happen. So everybody is treated the same. And um, when you do, if you do a development, you're, I guess you're a developer. 
uh, whether you're only doing one or whether you're that's your job but uh, but it is city ordinance that is governing what what the Planning Commission recommends uh, not someone's status I just gotta I just had to say that thank you all right all right yeah. I just want to make a really long comment so that your record doesn't get broken <laughs> just kidding um, the 24th Street project 550 I think it's just brought up a lot of questions um, for myself included I wondered if we could get copies of that audit sent to the council to review I uh, as it relates to the audit I was just I just pulled up the email that was sent to us it's uh, related to best practices and looking in other states Arizona for example doesn't have RDA or a tax increment in their state law I don't believe but they have <coughs> Bless you. they have requirements in law that anytime we use TIF, we have to show benefit. We have to prove the use and the benefit for the community and so on. So I think what's best practice here is written in law elsewhere. And I think it's important. It's showing to be important um, just, for, just for building trust. I mean, we just don't have it. So I hope we'll all take a close look at the report um, and see what we can do better. Thanks. All right. Before I entertain a motion to adjourn, I just wanted to offer to Chair Chaburka if she had any comments where she's not present with us. Oh, thanks so much. And um, you're doing a great job, Vice Chair um, Richie, um, doing the chairing. No comments for me, thanks. I, okay. I'll Thank second you. that, and I can make your motion now. Okay. Motion. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion to adjourn by Councilmember Blair and seconded by Councilmember Heyer. This is a voice. Oh, wait. Voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 That passes, I guess. So, <laughs> all right, we'll take a minute to reset for our special RDA meeting. I think she won. She reset? Won. Okay. Thank you. Welcome to the Special Redevelopment Agency meeting of March 21st, 2023. Let the record reflect that all board members are present with the exception of, is it board chair? Chair, chair, chair. chair Traberka, who is joining us online. Um, we'll first begin with the approval of minutes. Uh, board member Blair. Yes, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Ritchie. I have reviewed the special meeting the minutes of the special meeting of June 21st, 2022, the special meeting of July 5th, 2022, and the regular meeting of July 12th, 2022, and found them to be accurate. Thank you. Board Member Lopez. Uh, yes, I can chair. I reviewed those minutes, and I found them to be accurate, and I moved, we approved the minutes. Second. Motion to approve the minutes by Board Member Lopez, seconded by Board Member Blair. This is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. All right. Um, this, uh, our, we're on an uh, amended agenda so that we are now looking at uh, a motion to adjourn to a closed session. Chair, I'd make a motion that we uh, adjourn into a closed session for one of the items listed. Second. Motion by Council Member Heyer to move into a closed session for one of the items listed. Seconded by Board Member Blair. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, this is a roll call vote. Sorry, roll call vote. Board Member Blair? Aye. Board Member Heyer? Aye. Board Member Lopez? Aye. Board Member Nadolsky? Aye. Board Member White? Aye. Vice Chair Ritchie? Aye. Chair Traberka? Aye. All right, that passes. We will move to a closed session and we will adjourn from the closed session following the closed session. There. Thank you.